This is The Speaking Show. I'm David Newman, and you're tuned in to the number one podcast for speakers, consultants, and experts who want to speak more profitably. I have a unique value proposition for folks. If you love leads and clients, but you hate marketing, you're in luck because my friend Tom Poland is here. So Tom, you are the author of many fantastic books, but the two latest ones are Inbound Marketing and the Webinar Book. So Inbound Marketing Book and Marketing with Webinars. Let's start with our audience of consultants and sales professionals and experts What is inbound marketing and why is it so much better than outbound marketing? Great question to kick off with. So outbound versus inbound marketing. Essentially, outbound marketing is where you're approaching prospect with an offer without any prior knowledge that they have an interest in that offer. And inbound marketing makes the offer after we've established that the prospect has an interest. So for example, cold calling would, would definitely be outbound marketing. Sending 20,000 direct mail letters to suspects would be outbound marketing, saying, hey, call this number if you want consulting services today or if you whatever. So the metaphor that I like to use is the, is the 100 sleeping bears in the forest. There's 100 sleeping bears by some sort of magic. We know that three of them are hungry, and we've got a little honey pot, and we want them to eat our honey. So what outbound marketing would do, or the equivalent thereof, would get a long, sharp stick and go running through the forest, find a sleeping bear, jab it in the bum with the stick, and wake it up. And if the bears Let's see, hunger exceeds its anger, it would eat the honey and not us. But if it's not one of the three hungry ones, you know, we're just going to get a lot of pissed off bears. So that's what outbound marketing does. It's great for some products, and all marketing generates leads at the intersection of an offer and, and the ideal client. You know, we put a set of golf clubs that the ideal client's looking for at the right price, and they buy. You know? So it doesn't matter if it's a billboard or if it's a radio ad or if it's a webinar or whatever it happens to be. We've got to intersect the ideal client with the offer, right? So what outbound marketing does is, is it goes running to the forest, jabbing bears in the bum of the stick, as I said, and hopefully it's one of the hungry ones. Right. Inbound marketing simply puts the honeypot outside the forest and the hungry ones wake up going, hang on, well, there's some honey around here and they come out of the forest. So we might know this as, um, some people call it lead bait, which I think is an awful term, but a lead magnet, but it's something that we do. We put into the marketplace that people can put the hand up and say, I have an interest in that concept. And then we make them an offer. Think of it kind of like a first date. But I didn't go up to my now wife, whom I could have actually, because I fell in love at first sight, and say, you know, would you marry me? By the way, my name's Tom. But smarter than that, hopefully, and we, we have a coffee with them, and then we have a dinner date, and then so on. So in other words, we need to get an indication from the prospect that they have an interest. Otherwise, what happens is we engage in this incredibly inefficient and, frankly, mostly very ineffective marketing called outbound marketing, which... As I said, we'll work fine for a set of golf clubs or, or a car with a brand that we know people are looking for. Yeah. It's a good price. We know the brand. We know the quality. I'm interested in the car. You go buy it. And that, David, is the quintessential distinction between what coaches and consultants offer versus manufacturers. Because what we're doing is far more like we're sell- posing mirrors under the selling a washing machine. People are buying into a relationship. And if they're going to buy into a relationship, they're going to want to at least a first date. So let's talk about this because I think there's a lot. I know this is a rich area of your consulting expertise and your programs and the way you help people. People are listening to us and they go, oh, I know what Tom's talking about. I need to do content marketing, write a whole bunch of blogs, and then just sit and wait by the phone. And that must be what inbound marketing is. So content marketing is a subset of inbound marketing, but it's not sufficient Posting a bunch of blogs, then like hoping the phone right. rings, that's not what we're talking about. So let's well, go one layer deeper. Okay. What do we need to activate this sort of inbound engine to start producing conversations for us? Uh, I love the way you articulated that. It's a subset. Content marketing is a subset. The thing with blog posts or podcasts, you know, publishing the social media style content is that if you do that every day, well, you know, most days pretty regularly with high quality content, then it will really work well after about five years. So do you want to wait that long? Or perhaps is this a low lying fruit that we could pick that we can identify? And the way I put it is like this, social media is kind of like speed dating. 
But if you run an event, it's like taking your prospect out in the town for a night and having dinner and a show and maybe coffee at my place afterwards, hopefully. <laughs> the social media's purpose is to keep the brand in the brain until people are ready to buy. It's not to give them the buying value proposition. So events are really the very best way of, first of all, getting the hungry bears out of the forest because they're putting some skin in the game. There's yeah. not a lot of skin in the game when you're reading a blog post, particularly if you don't even need to opt in. But with attending an event, they have to register. And even if they don't turn up, even if they get sort of get a better offer at the last moment, they've registered, indicating they have an interest in that and the benefit of whatever that event is, the subject is covering. Right. So, so let's uh, talk about this because I know that you've also mastered a variety of different events and different sort of prospect type of interchanges to get them to raise their hand and say, Tom, you're so handsome. You're so fabulous. I need to work with you immediately. What are yeah. some of those different event types that you're referring to? Well, just to correct you there, the first question is normally, where do I get my hair done? Ah. But after that, yes, what sort of event type? So I've run over 500 physical events where, you know, you hire a conference center and you, in the old days, we would buy mail lists and it was a combination of inbound and outbound. We go outbound to get people to the event. But when they're at the event, they put their hand up and said, you know, I, I'm hungry for some honey. So we would I run over 500 of those. So that's, that's quite a few over quite a few years. And there's, and there's no question that running a physical event is one of the very best ways that you can generate a large volume of high quality new client inquiries. Yeah. But it's incredibly complicated to run these effectively. And it's very expensive. And there's a lot of moving parts. And with COVID-19, which we're in currently at the moment, and that'll disappear one day, but, but at the moment we've got it. But the combination, if you want a combination of the highest level of efficiency and the highest level of effectiveness, if you award points for those two things, efficiency and effectiveness, then webinars would come out on top. Because, I, you know, I can commute from the, I mean, our house is here on the sand next to the Blue Ways, a little castaways beach in Queensland, Australia, and we reach out to people all over the world. My commute is down the hallway with my, you know, from the espresso machine with my espresso every morning. This is as good as it gets in marketing world. I mean, you and I are old enough to know that hopping on planes and trains and flying everywhere and setting up banquet centers with coffee and OJ and croissants and so on and shaking people's hands before the meeting and so on and so on and so on and so on. It works really well and it can, it right. can be fun to a point. And then it works so well, you sort of become a victim of your own success and you think, yeah, this is a bit over the top now. <laughs> right. Let me ask you this because people see folks like you doing webinars. They see folks like me doing webinars. And there's a little bit of a chicken or the egg syndrome because they mm. go, wait a second. Webinars work for Tom because Tom has this big, beautiful email list. He sends one email, yeah. he'll get 500 people on a webinar. David sends one email, he'll get 500 people on a webinar. It's magic all of a sudden. Before yeah. we had these lists, before we had the beautiful hairstyles that we both have, so people say, well, I need webinars to get leads, but don't I need leads to fill webinars? How does that work if we're starting early in our career or we're just exploring our first couple of webinar experiences? Well, the, the key word you use there is starting. I mean, virtually none of my clients start work with me with any sort of an email list, let alone a large one. But, you know, as I say to them, we we're all born naked. None of us were born with an email list. Right. You know, I started with eight people on my email list, and I think my mother-in-law was one of them. Yeah. So, so you start and you run a webinar with maybe two people and you feel like a goose. But in that process, you know, you earn your stripes, you go through your apprenticeship, you present and you, you stumble. And it's like anything else, like learning a golf swing or a tennis swing or learning how to sing or to paint. You're not going to do it that well to start with. So you are better actually to start with lower numbers because you're probably going to stuff a few things up and wait, you know, for the 500 attendees, you know, maybe by then you want to be a little better because you don't want to blow it with a big number. Of right. We start organically. We just invite people that might look at our email outbox and, hey, let me invite these five clients here. Let me invite these three people. You know, here's 10 Correct. prospects who said no to me. Let me invite them just for something for free to see if we can reactivate them. And, you know, 10, 15, 20 people, like you said, maybe two people is where we start. But then the next one is more and the next one is more and the next yeah. one is more. Yeah, correct. And, you, you know, start by going through all of your past clients you've had all the people that were prospects that you met that didn't go ahead and so on. And go to MailChimp.com or MailerLite, L-I-T-E.com and sign up for a free account. You can get 2,000 email subscribers in there for $0, which is a pretty good price. 
But start with that five, six, seven, eight dozen people. Announce the fact that you're now running webinars and you've got a great webinar coming up with ABC and they'll discover X, Y, Z and so on. Tell them it's going to be exclusive. You're going to limit numbers to six or whatever it is you think you can get there and then do one. (laughs) That's where the genius, the magic, the power is and it's beginning the thing. For sure. Hey, good looking. Are you currently getting paid to speak? Would you like to ramp that up? We can help. Book a confidential speaker strategy call with our team at doitmarketing.com slash call, and let's see what we might do together. The call is free, but the results may be priceless. Now, you have obviously an entire book, and you consult, and you help people with webinars. One webinar mistake I've seen that I would love your take on is people will say, well, I want to get mid-market CEOs. And then I say, okay, well, that's interesting. What's the topic of your webinar? The topic of the webinar is basic supervisory skills. No mid-market CEO is going to be even interested, remotely interested in that topic. So there's like a message or topic mismatch with who we'd like to attract onto the webinar. How do you help people? How do you guide people to make sure they're fishing in the right ponds with the right webinars? Well, if I can go just a back step before that, and I'll you know, tell you exactly how to do it. But the first observation, of course, is that's the feature. Mid-level supervisory skills, this is the thing we do, but what's the benefit of doing that? Because that's what they want. Yeah. Uh, because they don't really care. I mean, my people don't care that I do marketing webinars. They just want a, a high-quality flow of weekly inbound new client inquiries. That's what they've... And with that, if I could show them how to do that by standing on, you know, in front of their garage on their heads for five minutes a day, they'd do that. So the feature or how we get to the benefit is That's not what's going to attract people to the title. Almost every single person I speak to, I say, well, look, let's say you've got a qualified prospect. You know, they've got the money, the timing is right. You know, they have an interest, you know, they've come out to the honeypot and you have a cup of coffee with them. And let's say it's a 40 minute conversation and they ask you about where you work and how you work, what the pricing is, what the benefits are. I said, I'll bet you with a high quality prospect, you're going to convert 70 to 90% of them into a client at that coffee meeting. 40 minutes. Great. And everyone knows, yep, I can do that. That happens all the time regularly. Great. But the problem is, Tom, I don't, can't get in front of enough high-quality prospect. Exactly. So think of it like this. You've got the coffee scenario, 40 minutes. What if you had to distill the benefit of working with you on a billboard and people driving by on the freeway had to see that benefit in less than five seconds to view it? What would you put on that billboard? And that's the title of the webinar. And that's the difference between 101 versus scalable marketing is we've got to be able to articulate the benefit of working with you we should be in the context of attending this webinar. And now, you know, we, our, our positioning is pretty straightforward, David. It, it's come along and see how my clients in 27 cities and 15 time zones around the world are generating a weekly flow of high-quality leads from webinars. So the value proposition has to be obviously directly aligned to the service or the consulting thing that you want to sell. And the, the way I suggest you do it is just make it a demonstration of how you work with your clients. Because that's a very direct, a very honest, a very transparent value proposition. If you would like to know how my clients are benefiting from X, Y, Z, and ABC, come along and I'll show you how I work with them. Now, that's a really good honeypot because if anyone is interested in the benefit of working with you, to get the benefit of working with you, is going to register for and attend the webinar. And if they don't have any interest whatsoever in the benefit of working with you, then they're not going to come, which is exactly what you want. You don't want everyone attending your webinar. You just want the hungry bears, right? So this is the value bomb right here. You need to rewind the last three minutes of what Tom Poland just said, and this is the genius. This is the highlight right here, is that the topic of the webinar is how we help our clients get outcome X, Y, and Z. And obviously, the only people interested in that on some level, consciously, subconsciously, they're like, I would like to be one of Tom's clients that gets outcome X, Y, and Z. Otherwise, why would I come to see how his clients get outcome X, Y, and Z? Now, at the end of this, well, we can break this down to whatever extent you want to. I'm imagining most webinars have a quote-unquote offer. And our poor consultants that are watching this, they go, oh, Tom, I love the teaching part. I just don't like the offer because the offer is a complete change in tone, change in direction. I feel like I've bushwhacked them. I feel like I've trapped them. If this is the premise of your webinar, then the offer is simply a very organic, natural extension. That's kind of like the punchline of the webinar. Am I right? Absolutely. The offer is a second date. You know, the first date was the webinar. 
A couple of things I'd like to add, David. One is it's the officers to have a conversation about whether working together is the right thing to do. Yes. It's not a free consulting session where you get a bunch of ideas and you think you can walk away and implement because we all know that the implementation and the idea are very, very different sides right. of a canyon. <laughs> so they're going to need a hand to implement. So let's be honest and open. And I say that explicit during the webinar. You know, it's like, think of it like this. I'm going to show you around the car. You kind of come to the showroom. We might even hop you in the car and we'll drive around. But if you want to build the car, you're probably going to need a hand with that, right? Right. So long as you're okay with that, I will show you all around the car. We can look under the hood and the trunk and everything else. But bear in mind that, you know, you get some value from this, you'll be able to kick the tires and so on. But if you want to build a car, we might want to talk about working together. So the offer is a very soft, gentle offer. They get your booking link so they can book a time to have a chat with you. The way we do it is they have to go to a page and check some boxes to say, I have your fees in my budget. And this is how much I understand the fees are. This is the fee range. You know, I could be spending anything, if it's a consultant, from 15000 to 500000 I understand that, yes, I have the lower end of that, at least in my budget. If we agree it's a good idea to work with it, I'm actually ready to start. I would check that box because you don't want to speak to people who want to start in nine months' time. And I understand this is not a sales ambush, but neither is it a free ideas session. It's a conversation between two adults to see if it's a good idea to work together. So they check those boxes, and they are the filters that need to have in place. So we keep the tire kickers out. If you want to come back to the showroom tomorrow, you can do that. But... If you're interested in you know, having a car, we want to make sure you're a serious prospect. So it's a very soft offer, but they are aware of fees. So you don't have that awkward moment during the consult where they go, well, what does it cost to work with you? And you tell them and they go, oh my God, I had no idea it was so expensive. I'm sorry, but bye-bye. The other thing I wanted to add is the reason that I recommend you position it as a demonstration of how you work with your clients is because we've all been to the free training webinar and you discover it was you know 12 minutes of content and 40 minutes of sales pitch. You, you get ambushed, right? You use the word bushwhack. So let's be clear and open and transparent with our value proposition right from the get-go. When we ask them out for the first date, let's tell them what's going to happen and let's deliver on the promise. Don't use bait and switch because if I'm attending a webinar and someone's done bait and switch for me, they told me I was going to get X, but it turns out it's just a sales ambush. I look at that person and think they weren't open and honest and transparent with the very first value proposition before I've paid the money. Is it going to get any better after I've paid the money? Probably not. Exactly. So just like there are some things that need to happen before and during and after the consult, I'm guessing there are some things that need to happen before and during and after the webinar to actually have the kind of webinar that would convert into lots of these exploratory conversations. What are some value bombs around the webinar marketing that you so brilliantly have in the book? Well, the two reasons that come out most often in our surveys as to why people don't do marketing webinars is number one is they don't know where to get audiences from. And they really don't want to look at Goose and Facebook, you know, live doing with one person there. (laughs) Awkward. And the second thing is they don't know how to come up with fresh content that's engaging and interesting and adds value because most people want to finish the webinar feeling that the audience has gained value, whether they buy anything or not. And that's, that's added value marketing. It's the way we build our brand and reputation for being able to deliver value. And not everyone's going to be ready to buy at any given point in time. So if we look at those two, the fresh audiences, so we get 90% of our audiences from other people's networks. And we have a nice big email list of 31,000 growing at the stage by about 1,000 a month organically, which is great. One of my clients said to ask me the other day, well, how often should I market to my email list? And I said to him, look, the purpose of your email list is not to market your stuff to them. The purpose of your email list is to market other people's stuff to them. And that's a bit of a paradigm flip, isn't it? You know, I thought right. I was building an email list so I could sell a bunch of stuff. Yes, but not your stuff. If you think about it like this, so the audience has come from other people's networks. So my 31,000 odd subscribers, I'm really better to once a week offer someone else's webinar or honeypot, whatever it might be, lead magnet, e-guide, book, whatever, to my 31,000 subscribers. Because in doing that and not pushing my stuff, I then open myself up to 52 different audiences during the year. Because there's 52 weeks in the year. So I, there's a multiplier factor of 52 marketing to my own email list versus marketing other people's quality product services to my email list and me marketing to theirs. Multiply a factor of 52, assuming there's four weeks in the whole day, it's still a lot, right? So that's the first thing is you get your audiences from other people's email lists or OPN, as I call them, yeah. joint ventures. We don't quite do it the way the traditional joint venture does it, but that's the answer to where you get your audiences from. That is the whole system in itself. We have a thing called an algorithm to figure out the sweet spot because you don't want to approach someone who, first of all, you don't want to approach someone to do a webinar swap. You want to re- do something for them, which is terrific, first of all, promote their book, 
reposted blog, retweet the tweets, build reciprocity, do some cool stuff for people. And we have a whole formula for identifying these people, putting them through an algorithm, which you're aware of, David. And finally, out of every, every 10 people we identify, we've probably got two people, maybe even one, that would actually end up doing some sort of OP and swap with where they're promoting my book, I'm promoting the book, and we're growing each other's email list and so on. So that's where the audiences come from. Not from your own email list, but from other people's email lists. Second thing is regard to content. We always start with the title. And we talked a little bit about that. It's got to be benefit rich. It's got to be different to what other people are saying. So not feature, not, you know, skill sets for mid-sized supervisory management or whatever. It's got to be the benefit of that. It's got to be different to whatever any of your competitors are saying. And it's got to contain specifics. So title, big billboard. Uh, that's how much real estate we have sort of thing. And then there's got to be a sequence that we walk people through. Why should they listen to you? Where's the proof that what you have works pretty well? What's the promise? What's the transformation in this person's life or business once they've implemented my advice, et cetera? And we do that using an NLP technique where they can actually visualize a physical change and the emotional experience of that change. Then what are the principles behind the model? And then what's the actual value delivery model? We know more than three steps because the enemy of motivation is complication. The biggest mistake I see people making with content is they try to deliver too much. Yes. We've literally got to keep it so that a 12-year-old who had no knowledge whatsoever of your experience can understand it. And so you'll find that being comprehensive or being clear are mutually exclusive. Less you, you get, is more in the webinar world. Yeah. So what a lot of people do is they have their imaginary colleagues sitting on their shoulders as they're putting the webinar together going, I wonder if my contemporaries or my professional colleagues could criticize us at all. I don't want that to happen. So we'll make it absolutely bulletproof. And so the number could say, well, you left this out or you didn't say this. or you didn't. Well, to hell with them. I mean, we're preaching to, you know, if you like the unwashed mashes, they don't know a lot about what we do. So we've got to keep it freaking simple. The time for more complexity is when we are on a drip feed from the value step by step. Once they become a client, we can lead them through that in a simple way. Right. But not at the webinar. What a great episode. Wowza. Tell you what, if you want to ramp up your revenue as an expert who speaks professionally, you should really check out our free online training at doitmarketing.com slash webinar. Now, let's say that we have some case studies. We have some case studies. We have some clients because the premise of the webinar is how we help our clients achieve outcome X, Y, and Z. How do we frame those case studies or testimonials or success stories so that they are teaching moments and not bragging moments. You, you can do that as case studies, and that's before and after. You know, here's David, and he was, you know, bald, and now look at him, he's got hair. How do we do that? And this was his concern. So, you know, we can do all that. I do it real simple. I just, under the section is why listen to me, we give them three snapshots. This is what, you know, Derek Roberts said, you know, before Leadsology, blah, 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 and now bang. And it's just really simple, really fast. And essentially, it's a repetition of what's in the title, the benefits in the title. You know, I now have a full pipeline of inquiries from some of the largest companies in the world. You know, Derek is a consultant, Taste Emotions consultant. So just some quick vignettes, if you like, from people that would represent typical clients, so people that I think are going to be in the audience, coaches, consultants, primarily financial planners and so on. And we give one slide, quick snapshot, photo, name, company, testimonial, typically you know, 15 words, that would be it. And if people are starting out and they go, well, I don't have those, Tom, or I haven't collected them yet, then we create a scenario, Sam and Pam. And Sam is the before scenario. And, and you explain to people, this is typically what would happen with our client journey experience. Meet Sam. Sam is a typical pre-client person. You know, his business is bad, 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 pain, 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 pain. Right. And we would work with someone like Sam. We would work with them over a 12-week period, a 12-month period, we do X, Y, Z. And this is what the outcome would typically look like. Meet Pam. Tick, 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 tick. Pleasure, 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 potential, potential, potential. Thing. But um, so that gives you before and after. And it's like a sort of like a weight loss scenario. You know, here's me fat and unhappy before. Here's me nice and slim and smiling afterwards. It's the before and after scenario, except we're doing that verbally. I'm channeling our viewers, and here's what they're saying to Tom Poland. But Tom, this is easy for you because you're a marketing guy. And they say to me, David, this is easy for you because you're a marketing guy. What if I have like a non-financial, non-metrics-based value proposition? So I'm a leadership consultant. I sell team building. I sell accounting software. You know, I sell something where it's not directly 
marketing and sales related, I can't really quote these dollars and percentages and so forth. Is that yeah. important or should they think of some way to reframe their outcomes? Well, it's important that we're specific about the benefit, about the transformation. It's a great point you make. It doesn't have to be a commercial benefit. It can be an emotional shift. Karen, who's a client out of uh, Canada, turns anxiety, what did you say, from stressing to progressing. So a lot of people that have suffered from anxiety can be absolutely crippling. Sure. And so to turn it from stressing to progressing, that's her magic form. That's her USP, if you like, or a title, et cetera. A honeypot, you know, figure out how to, how to turn anxiety from stressing to progressing. But there is going to be a way to articulate the transformation. That's essentially what we're after. And I, I call that the magic. What's your magic? What changes in the life? And we have to get very specific about that. So with Karen's clients, you can't put the results on a spreadsheet. You can't stick it, you know, as a result of an algorithm or something, but you can talk about how they can wake up in the morning finally with a clear mind and the first thought is a happy thought and not one that goes to anxiety and stress. You can talk about the interaction with children and loved ones and the impact you could measure things like blood pressure, I guess. You can talk about the fact that when they open their bathroom cabinet, they no longer see a row of antidepressants and so on, so on, so on. Instead, you know, they're enjoying the carriage. I don't know. I'm making this up as I go. Sure. The point is that we can articulate the transformation, the before and the after, and it doesn't have to be metrically driven. It can be emotionally driven. Totally fantastic. Spot on. Now, let me ask you this also, because you mentioned about other people's networks. We're all excited about webinars. You've got sort of the webinar formula. We're going to follow you. We're going to get the book. We're going to get the goodie that we're going to share with people in a couple of minutes here. So we're locked and loaded. But they go, well, Tom, wait a second. I have like a, a negligible email list, very, very small. How can I go to a Tom Poland who's got 30,000 plus, plus, plus and say, Tom, I would love you to promote my webinar to your audience. And like you said, you don't go in there cold either. There's been some relationship building. You're retweeting, you're featuring, you're praising, you're liking. Mm -hmm. So you develop a little bit of a relationship, but there's also some pretty big inequity between your teeny tiny non-existent list and someone's list of 10 or 12 or 15 or 30,000. Do we start with people that are closer to our range or how do we start the dating process for other people's networks? Right. Well, I, I listened to a relationship coach once and he said, it's like you get points. So you get some, you know, depending on who you can ask out for a date and get a yes. So you get a points for being good looking and get some points probably for the sort of car you drive or the career status you have with the doctor or lawyer versus um, a house painter might have different points and so on. So you have to add all these points up and that's what you bring to the party. So, you know, if I had George Clooney's good looks, I might not need as much money in my bank account to get a yes from that proposal. Marketing webinars is kind of a similar value proposition. So you get some points for the quality of the content of your webinar because I'm not going to let anyone in my email list who's got quality for a webinar because that reflects very badly on my brand. I'm the guy who introduced you to my list sort of thing. So that's some points we bring to the table. The next set of points you bring to the table is the size of your email list and their responsiveness, because they're two very different things. We've marketed to people's email list with 60,000 subscribers allegedly and got eight registrants. So the responsiveness level, and that's the list that's just been thrashed with sales offers repeatedly day in, day out. So there's a lot of ways you can get to the required number of points for someone like you or me to say, yeah, I think that's a great idea. So let's first of all focus on the quality of the presentation because that's the thing that I want to know about if I'm going to recommend someone to my that my list goes and attends this webinar. Is it going to be great? Whether they buy or not, are they going to get some great value? I'm going to get emails saying, Tom, that was such a shitty thing or am I going to get emails going, I'm so glad you introduced me to David because he was spectacularly interesting and valuable and so on. So that's the first thing is build on the quality of the content because that gives you some points. The next thing is I'd say it's kind of like if you've got a small email list, start with other target people with small email lists. We have a formula of figuring that out. To start with, you're probably going to be a bit blind, but you'll figure it out after a while. I mean, I'm not going to approach Frank Kern and say, hey, should we do a webinar swap or you know, a Dan Kennedy or someone like that because they're playing the game in a much bigger sandpit than the one that I'm playing in. And you know, I started doing swaps with people that had 12 registrants and five registrants and 20 registrants. And but running webinars is one of the fastest ways to grow a high quality email list because you get every registrant that registers for your webinar is, is legitimately onto your email list and is receiving invitations to future events and so on. So it's a very fast way to grow a quality list. 
buying an email list, trying to buy an audience, that is just a great way to waste money. You might as well just take half your budget, flush it down the toilet and keep the rest because you'll be better off. So that's how you get started with doing webinar swaps. Make sure your content is fantastic and then start predominantly with people that are going to be playing the game at a similar level to you in terms of the number of registrants they can get. Yeah, that's a great, great idea. Let me ask you this about, so we start doing webinars. I know that you've been playing this game for a long, long time. You're great at it. People will complain, hey, I got 35 people on my first webinar, had a couple of conversations, but nothing really converted. Then I had 47 people on my next webinar and some of the same people from webinar one came to webinar two and they didn't book a call the second time either. And I'm really mad now because they're taking my free content, Tom. And what's going on when you take my content, you better book a call. So talk about the long game. Talk about the longevity that how many times we have to nurture and add value sometimes before someone right. is ready to buy. Right. So if you look at attendees, 3% of them will just want the buy button. You know, they'll go, look, I don't have to wait 45 minutes to get to find out how I book a consult. Tom, can I just have that up front? Well, yeah, I'm right. sorry you do. But so that's only 3%. And 12% will want, and we've measured this by what they do with our website and the bookings they make and the downloads they make and where they go on our pages. We can track people, of course. Big Tom is watching. And we know that 12% of the audience need five dates before they'll accept my proposal for a consult. So they've downloaded an e-guide, they've attended a webinar, might have attended two webinars, I don't know, gone back, bought a book, et cetera. So it's five, done five-day challenge. Five exposures to my brand before they reach out to register an interest in purchase. That's 12%. And that leaves us with 85% who just wander in and out of webinars for the rest of their life, which is right. fine. So the 3% I call the seekers, they just want to know where the buy button is, book a consult. 12% are the explorers because they have a need that has to be satisfied before they buy, which is to explore the brand. And if I only offer them one, one opportunity to do that, then they will have the need satisfied by exploring someone else's brand. So we can leave a lot of money on the table if we only have one added value piece of content. Other than that, I mean, I've had people literally have attended my webinars for five years before they made an inquiry. You know, if people think they can implement without your expertise or without my expertise or without our listeners' expertise, what's that saying about the person who represents themselves in court has a fault as a client? Yes, exactly. <laughs> you, exactly you're going right. to go down. So multiple contacts like this are actually a good sign and we should not be mad and we should not be resentful. This is just the process that they need to go through to build yeah. trust and to build relationship with you before they say, Tom, I think you're my guy. We need to have a talk. Yeah, I'd be worried if they are coming back. Right. Because they, you know, either they don't have an interest in my, the benefit of my service, which is fine. Perhaps they misunderstood to start with. But was my content good enough to bring them back? At the end of the first date, if I, if I said, David, could we have a second date? And you said, I don't think so, Tom, not after that show. Then right. I'm going, okay, I better look at my content, right? <laughs> right. So let's talk about your gift because you have a pretty awesome gift specific to this topic, which is webinars and lead generation and a demonstration of this entire process we've been talking about. What will they find when they go there? Just tee it up for us. So the way I run webinars is very different to the way a lot of people run webinars. There's very high engagement levels. So as measured by our webinar platform, the average marketing webinar has attended to this level of 23%. Ours are between 73 and 94%. So we really get people engaged. So the best thing that people could do if they want to take a step forward in marketing webinars is to attend one of my live demonstrations where we actually demonstrate. You can sit there if you like, um, and you can get value at two levels. One is as a regular old attendee, if you like, and saying, well, how do you generate leads with webinars? Because we go into a lot more detail. But the second level of value is to say, okay, I see what he's doing. I see where he did. Why listen to me? I see where he did. What's the promise? And I see how he did that. I see how he's covered the principles and so on. So and I see how he did the call to action, the consult offer, and I can see how he did the landing page. So you get quite a lot of value, if I think, if you just simply attend one of our live events, which we do once a month. I love it. And Tom, I, I want to give you some public praise right here, right now, because you get this from many, many people. I get this comment from many, many people. I think this is why we like each other so much. They say, you know why you should listen to Tom? 
Because Tom is not worried about preaching what he practices. He only practices what he preaches. He only practices what he preaches and what works. So you're either doing it to them or you're teaching it to them. Just like I'm either doing it to them or teaching it to them. And because we're drinking our own Kool-Aid, folks need to know that it works. It works, it works, it works. So parting thoughts about webinars, webinar marketing for consultants and experts. What final words of wisdom would you like to leave us with? Well, the most important thing clearly is to get started. You know, people ask me what the most important thing in marketing is. And I said, doing some, you know, (laughs) it's just, that's the most important thing you can do. But after that, I would say, think of webinars as not your marketing channel, but as an auxiliary to whatever else you're doing. With COVID, we're going to have a new normal. We know all the people who thought they had to be there physically in person every single meeting. Now they're thinking again, thinking, well, maybe, maybe some of our meetings we can do online like this. I mean, I'm, I like sitting here in our house on the sand next to the Waze Little Castaways Beach and having clients all around the world, literally. So I'm not going to be going out and and doing those physical events. But some people, you might want to do that. So think of webinars as an auxiliary. It's got to be a system. And I I use the metaphor of train tracks. You've got to lay down the train tracks. Because the hardest thing about getting a train from point A to point B has nothing to do with the train. It's laying down the tracks. So the train tracks are a really good metaphor for a system. So you have a system for developing your content. You have a system for the consults. You have a system for the audiences. Those are the three main systems you need. You know, as I often say to people, you think you have a lead generation problem, you don't. You have a lead generation system problem because it's the lack of the system, like the cup of coffee over 40 minutes. Sure, you can convert that client. But if you want to do that predictably, week in, week out with a bunch of people, that's where you need the system. I love it. Well, thank you, my friend. Always a pleasure learning from you. You're a rock star and I appreciate you. Thanks, David. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Speaking Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on iTunes. Subscribe, tell a friend. Go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thespeakingshow.com. See you next time. 